Hello, I'm Elder Hartley, and since the man that is featured in the following video, Sai Baba, is so little known in the United States, I want to give you a little background. In 1973, I went to India with Dr. Elmer Green and some of his staff at the Menninger Foundation to produce a film on biofeedback. And we spent three months there trying to find yogis who could control internal states. But I discovered this book, Sai Baba, Man of Miracles. It excited me so much that I left the Menninger group for a few days and went to a conference where Baba was speaking. And the material that I sought there finally ended up uh, years later in a film called Hinduism and the Song of God. And I'd like to show you a few excerpts from that right now. This was a conference of Sai Baba's followers on the east coast of India, held to discuss the organization and future plans of the many Sai Baba activities, schools, hospitals, help for the needy. More than 5,000 attended. Thousands more begged for entrance. People clamor to buy his picture, to put on their puja table or in their car or where they work, wherever it will serve to remind them that they too can become as he. At that time, in 73, Sai Baba was already well known in India as the man of miracles. There were countless stories about the people he'd healed or those he'd saved from disaster. Others about how he turned water into gasoline when his car ran out of it. Or how he pulled any fruit his companions wanted from a single apple tree. He's been doing this from an early age and he's still doing it. Sai Baba is considered an avatar, an incarnation of God, and when he appears, he is treated like a divine being. Sai Baba stresses following the Dharma, the path of right action. We must learn to be in the world, but not of it. Being of the world binds us to the law of karma, the law of, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. A boat, he says, is meant to go into the water, but the water must not get into the boat. In the same way, we are meant to be in the world, but the world must not get into us. When Baba leaves, those who could not get in cry for just a glimpse of this holy man, or even so little from someone so great, they feel, bestows a blessing. It seems so strange that a man of his powers, a man considered by those who know him to be another Christ, another Buddha, so strange that he should be so little known in the United States. One would think the whole world would be at his feet. Well, ever since then, I wanted to do a film about him but the time was not right until last fall. But Baba doesn't make it easy to publicize him. No cameras of any kind are allowed inside the walls of the Mandir where he holds darshan every day. And of the several films that I've seen about him, none of them ever had anything planned in advance, an interview. They were always just catch as catch can as he passes, as you saw in that film of ours. So knowing that this was the case, I wasn't disappointed at the difficulty of getting near him with a camera. People ask us, did you see him materialize something or did you see him uh, heal somebody? Well, yes, we saw him materialize Vibhuti and you will see it in the film. He just slips his wrist and hands a man this sacred ash and he rubs it on his forehead. And we spoke to a number of people who'd been healed of 
very difficult diseases. Iris Murphitt was healed instantly of hepatitis. Uh, another woman was healed of deep, deep depression and a man of cancer. But I don't think that's the main story. To me, the real miracle is the changes that he has wrought in the daily lives of the people he comes in contact with. And we found that in abundance. Many of the people we interviewed told stories of transformation that were very moving. So you will see Baba taken with a telephoto lens, and you will see the life in the ashram. But mainly, you will see his works, the miracle that has happened in the lives of people he's touched. The trip from Bangalore to Puttaparthi is a perfect metaphor for the spiritual journey. Chaos and confusion in the beginning, but then the road becomes broad and smooth for a while. Why take the trip? That question has been asked of spiritual seekers since the beginning of history. Why go thousands of miles to be near a spiritual master? Well, every person has his own reasons, but underneath all is that basic drive of human beings to grow in awareness. And once you've gotten on that path, no trip is too long or road too bumpy. This one soon becomes straight and narrow. The road that leads from Bangalore to Puttaparthi in South India, a three to four hour drive, goes through villages with blasting sound systems and quaint customs. Some moments of despair, but often smiling faces. The metaphor holds. There are numerous obstructions. The magnet that draws people to Puttaparthi is a man born here, Satya Sai Baba. The meek and downtrodden, as well as the powerful and mighty, flock round him. They say he's divine, a fully enlightened being. Finally, we sense that we're entering the promised land, Puttaparthi, nine kilometers. Puttaparthi is like every other Indian village, except for the many stores selling pictures, cassettes, and books about Sai Baba. Entering Prasantinilium is to the physical journey what entering Nirvana is to the spiritual journey. All trivia is shed. Hundreds of people, each worshiping in his own way. The blasting loudspeakers of the village are replaced by pleasant music. The air is calm, the grounds clean and uncluttered. 
They say they come here because they find their own spiritual growth augmented when they're in this atmosphere where everyone is a seeker, but particularly because being near an avatar speeds the process. They come from every religious background and every ethnic group. Of course, practical things must be taken care of, like where to live, so they head for the accommodations office. For visitors, there are a dozen large buildings called sheds, and six of these large round buildings, each housing several hundred. They're an equal number for more permanent residents. People from all parts of the world find a common bond here. Germany, Mexico, Australia, England. Michael Oliver is from the United States. I was on a trip around the world, and uh, the trip encompassed many different countries. I was going to Europe and India, um, Thailand, and Australia. And coming to India, I knew I was going to do something spiritual. I had no idea what, however. And right before I left America, I met somebody who gave me the first bit of information about Sai Baba, and which planted a seed into my head. Later, when I got to London, again, somebody gave me a book about Sai Baba, which had, it actually amazed me that having so much involvement in, in various types of spirituality in America and in the New Age uh, type of spirituality, all many different things I touched upon, I had never heard of Sai Baba, and that amazed me. And now, all of a sudden, I was hearing about him. And in London, I found out more about him, and I was trying to get on to my next destination, which was Rome. And uh, I had been unable to get the reservation, the plane reservation. And right about that time, I had a vision where Sai Baba came to me. And just as you and I are standing and talking right now, in, in a waking state like this, and Sai Baba told me the exact time to come to his ashram, and he said, that all of my travel arrangements had been taken care of. And one hour after that, I got a call at work in London from the airline agency, and they had told me that there had been a cancellation on the flight the exact day that I had wanted to go and that they had me booked and reserved on that date. <coughs> and it was like that, one after another. I had similar incidences later on in Rome and, and traveling and coming to India. It was very similar. I had an experience, let me tell you this. And I was in the light, so I asked my teacher, how does it come? How can I get more of this one, this <clears throat> special light? And then it starts looking for a spiritual path. And on this way, 12 years with Ekanka, I found this special woman, Ermgard, who lives now here in this ashram. And she told me, you have to go to India if you want to find the man like Jesus. And as a child, or a little bit more than a child, 17, I had the idea there must be a person like Jesus, or a son of God again. Yeah, it's too long time ago, 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years. Uh, and so we start with the family. I want them, the family, to go with me to India. And when I just came in this ashram, I had the inner feeling, now I'm at home. Yeah. Uh, he came in a dream to me, and the first time I saw him in this, like, vivid, I can't tell you all the details, it would be too much, no? But this dream, in this dream, I come from this form, I felt this ocean of love, what I experienced formless, coming from this form. And I just got up, I said, finally I found you, in German. And he talked to me in German. Huh? Something very beautiful happened after that, which transformed my whole life, just like that. It's Personally speaking, I feel like seeing something on the equivalent of what's known as an avatar, someone who, in a sense, knows past and future and has reached the level of, of God realization, that that experience is something of a blessing that can change the course of your whole life. For me personally, it was connecting with something that I dreamed about many uh, num number of years ago. I actually had a dream in which the Mandir, which is behind me here, 
was a um, crystal palace of pink and blue. And I uh, dreamed visiting the place, and Baba was dressed in white, and seeing the entire experience was uh, extraordinary. I, I kept remembering the dream after I wrote it down for a number of months, thinking that there must be something to this because it was so vivid. And then eventually, I actually went over to a friend's house who had been involved with and seen Sai Baba before. But the first trip to their house, I asked them, what does the word Prashanti Niliyam mean? And Prashanti Niliyam, little did I know, was the name of this place, but it somehow had come to me without knowing why. It's a few days before Baba's birthday, and the festivities are already beginning. Is this man so revered by his devotees? They plan processions to honor him. They sprinkle flowers in his path. They stand for hours just for a chance to see him. His pet elephant, Sai Gita, is bedecked and paraded for the occasion. a man now in his 60s who from early youth had psychic powers he has in the past and still does heal people of terminal diseases dozens of books have been written about him he lives quite simply in this building called the Mandir with its large courtyard where he holds darshan twice daily the children sit in the center the women on the right and the men on the left Although Darshan is held twice a day, the audience seems never to lose its feeling of suspense about seeing him again. When he appears, the feeling of awe and reverence is almost tangible. Many present letters asking for advice or help. Baba asks nothing for himself, but encourages his followers to spend their money on good works, like building hospitals and schools. And I met Baba four years ago in a dream. He came to me in the dream and he called me to come here. And then I came here and, he, and I had a big change in my life because he healed me from a very bad illness. I mean, it's, it's wrong to say he healed me. He showed me how to heal myself. This was the biggest experience I had. And then I had uh, two interviews with him, which were really great, which really changed my life totally, to get his, his vibrations, to know who I, I am, because he shows us who we are. Very, or he showed me how to heal myself from a very bad depression. I couldn't move anymore. I was so much depressed, I couldn't move anymore. I, I was a teacher in Germany and I was sent on pension because of that and then I came to Baba and he really gave me my life force. He showed me how to, to organize my life, how to be positive, how to, how to realize the way, how to find the God within. Uh, well, he teaches me how to love myself with all my imperfections, with all my so-called faults, because we don't have faults. It's just our energy pattern, and we should love it, we should accept it. When we accept and love ourselves, then we can accept and love the whole world and everyone, our neighbors, our children, our husbands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I speak of husbands <laughs> because I had two, and 
because I didn't love myself, these marriages broke off. And he taught me what I did to myself and what I did to my family. As part of my spiritual search, I got involved in uh, spiritual search groups, uh, was active in the Methodist Church, and, uh, and in some of the group activity, we were studying uh, various forms of healing. And one of Sa Baba's devotees shared with me her experience here and told me about this man of miracles who was much like Jesus in what he taught and in the miracles that he performed. She showed photochromes and shared with me some books and gave me one book that he had written which described all the world's religions and showed in the description of these religions that uh, the form was different but the content was the same. And this was a very important uh, book for me. I came under criticism from some of my friends about my interest in this Hindu Swami <clears throat> and so I was somewhat bombarded but I had an interesting experience in a very traditional setting. This was in Sunday school at the Methodist Church which I attend in Richmond. Our minister was leading us in a meditation and in the meditation I had a vision and in this vision there appeared Jesus and Saw Baba and then I was in the vision too. Well before the two figures appeared there was an eagle. Vivid eagle appeared before my eyes and at the time I didn't understand the symbology. I learned later the eagle symbolizes the messenger of God. And then following that there appeared Jesus and there appeared Sai Baba and then I was there and there were three of us and Jesus and Sai Baba went out over the world spreading light and I went out also spreading light and of course I was simply symbolic of each one of us as individuals and our importance in spreading the light <clears throat> and uh, and following that in my prayer and meditation, I begin to get the sense of the presence of Saw Baba. Uh, and experience is not exactly like that, but uh, very significant in which I was giving, uh, given teachings that were uh, very important to my personal growth at the moment. Signs reminding followers to stay on the path are displayed in a number of places. On the main street, where the traffic is heaviest, a blackboard carries the thought for the day. Some simply read it and pass on, but many fill notebooks with these aphorisms. In the bookstore, there are many books about Baba written by dozens of authors, but the three that have probably had the most impact were written by an Australian named Howard Murphy. I remember I'd never seen a photo of Sai Baba. This was 1965. Never seen, had no idea what he looked like, none whatever. And uh, so suddenly the door opened and he came through. <laughs> He, came, he looked through the door and smiled, that wonderful smile he had. And uh, he looked at me, smiling face, smiling eyes, and said, are you the man from Australia? And I said, yes. I didn't even know, I wasn't even sure it was Sai Baba, to tell you honest, because I didn't expect him to have appearance, you know? I thought he'd be more like the pictures of the masters, you know, of the, of the White Lodge. Uh, and so I was taken by surprise. 
So I said, yes, I was, and then he just said, uh, he smiled, and he walked over to the two Indians, and he started talking to them, and, and then for the first time ever, I saw him produce the babuti, you see. I'd heard, somebody had told me that he, he did produce ass. Uh, I saw him do this for the two Indian gentlemen, and uh, he gave it to them, and he, he started, uh, patting one of them as if he was a child. And this man started crying like a child. See? And it was the first time I ever saw Bhakti tears. I've shed plenty myself since. You know what they mean. Bhakti tears, tears of devotion, tears of joy. And uh, after he'd done this, and this man crying, and he, Swami was patting him like a child, and he came over to me and said, would you like some babuti? Well, I didn't even know what babuti was, but I guess it was the ash that he had produced, so I said yes. Uh, and I knew then by that time he was Sai Baba, so I called him Baba. So he stood in front of me like that, as close as I am to you, and he, uh, he, he, he waved his hand and dropped some, took, a palmful of the booty into my palm. And he stood there smiling to see what I'd do with it. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I thought, what will I do with this? And he said, um, he didn't say anything. He didn't help me at all. And then uh, Bob Raymer came back into the room. And he saw my dilemma and he helped me. He said, eat it, it's good for your health. So I'm starting to eat this babuti, this ash, that I'd never eaten ash before. <laughs> and it's, it's quite edible. And uh, so uh, anyway, I'm eating it away and, he, and I suddenly thought, good for her health. And I thought Iris was back there and she had, uh, uh, she was not well, she had hepatitis. And uh, I thought, oh, look for health, it might help her. So I said, can I take some to my wife, Baba? She's not well. Bring her here tomorrow at five o'clock, he said. And, and left. That was my first interview. The healing, love is important for healing. When we first came to Swami, he said to me, don't worry about your health. I will look after you. I went through and he said, where's your wife? Oh, I said, you want me to bring her, Swami? So I went back and beckoned to her. And of course, all the ladies were very envious <laughs> that she could go in. So she came and then he stood talking to her and I was standing to the side a bit, you see. And uh, I wasn't really listening much to what he was saying, but he was talking to her about her health. And then at the end of her talking to her, he did this and produced some more vibhuti and gave to her. And uh, actually, she, uh, her uh, hepatitis vanished that day. She had no more. When I saw the specialist a couple of years ago and the tests had been taken, she said, I can't believe this. I have one picture here in front of me on my desk and I have another in you over there, and they're totally different. She said, I see a devastating picture on my desk, and I look at you, and you're the picture of health. It's his love that does it. And Howard asked once, he said, Swami, why do you cure some people and not others? And he said, it's like the sunshine. He said, my love falls on all. It is there for all. If you're open to receive it, you respond. Like the person who wants the light will be out in the sun. They won't be inside in the dark. And I think that is the thing with healing. I think it's purely love. The day in the ashram starts early. At five, women gather in groups to go through the streets singing spiritual songs. The men do the same. A frequent 
visitor describes her day, Ellen Young from Ojai, California. The day starts with Omkar, and that's 21 ohms that it's held in the Mandir, and everyone gathers inside the Mandir in the temple, and um, it's, a, it's a very purifying way to start the day. The, uh, following that is Nagasan Kirtan, which uh, everyone gathers outside of the women in one group and the men in another group, and they walk through the streets singing bhajans. <laughs> Bhajans are sacred songs that purify the atmosphere once again. Um, following that, uh, we line up in queues or in lines for the women all line up in one spot and the men are quite separate in another spot. And uh, you get to pick a number. The head of each line picks a number out of a little sack. And then if you're number one, you get to go sit in the front line, which means you get to be closer to Swami when he walks through the crowds in the morning. Swami comes out for darshan uh, uh, usually between 6.30 and 7 o'clock in the morning. And his darshan is the reason that we're all here. His darshan is the most beautiful experience in the world. Just this, darshan means the sight of the Lord, and when you look at the Lord, when you look at Swami, it absolutely is the most beautiful experience you can ever have. It cleanses you, it draws you closer to Him, it makes you part of Him, it uh, changes whatever needs to come away from you so that your love is, is uh, there for you to see. After uh, Darshan, I usually remain seated and uh, wait for him to come out again because uh, in about an hour and a half there will be uh, bhajans, and, which are sacred songs once again. Um, but I like to stay there because a lot of times he comes out several more times and goes across right in front of usually where I sit to the Purnachandra and you get to see him once again. And the Indians say that the sight of the Lord absolutely cleanses you. It takes away your past karmas, all your past uh, things that you've done in every lifetime. You get cleansed. So the more you see him, the more you, uh, you are cleansed. So anytime you see him is, uh, is beautiful and wonderful. And uh, even if he doesn't look at you, you know, even if he just, you just see him as a dot in the horizon, he's there and he's cleansing you and he's loving you and feeling really close to you. Bhajans uh, start at 9 and they go from 9 to 9.30. And uh, once again, um, this is sacred sound. And sacred sound is a vibration that absolutely purifies you. And what it purifies is the, your, your mental body, your emotions, your physical body, so that all of this is washed clean, so that what's really you, the love that's inside of you, is just there. Um, after that, there's usually a talk by someone like Al Drucker or other people, and, and this is at 10 o'clock, and this is for an hour, and this is usually Swami's teachings, and this is also wonderful. At 11 is lunch, and lunch uh, is in a canteen, and uh, there's a women's canteen and a men's canteen, and it uh, cost about two rupees or three rupees, which is equivalent to about 18 cents American. And uh, um, after lunch, usually I rest, and most people rest for a couple of hours. Then I come back out to wait to line up once again for uh, darshan in the afternoon around 3 o'clock. Uh, 3 o'clock, we do the lines once again and pick the numbers, and it's very exciting to see who gets to be closest to Swami this time. And you know he's putting you exactly where he wants you. You can sit anywhere, and if it's your turn to be in the front row, you'll be in the front row. And if it's not, you won't. He puts you everywhere because he does everything. Then um, he comes out again, and once again you get to see him. You get to watch him be with all his devotees. And, you get to f experience his love. He's just pure love, and you get to experience this. And then he goes away, and I sit there once again. I don't leave, because he might come out again. I might get to see him once again. And I stay until uh, Bajan's again in the afternoon, and that's at 5 o'clock, uh, 5.30. And from 5.30 to 6, uh, we sing.
There's an old saying of the Quakers, when you pray, move your feet. In other words, move, do something. Don't sit there praying, waiting for something to fall into your lap. Go out and work and make it happen. It can't come to you until you're open, and you can only be open through helping others. And this is what Swami is also teaching. It's no good sitting, praying, meditating, if you're not actually putting it into action. We can't expect grace to come unless we earn it. Swami says you have one stomach and you have two hands. Hands that work are much more holy, much more sacred than lips that pray. Get out there and do some good. But there's much savor going on here. Swami, Swami's organization adopted 6,000 villages uh, four years ago. And in every village, there are schools, there are uh, temples, there are roads, there are wells, there are uh, hospitals, or dispensaries at least, being constructed. And that has, I think, for the most part, been completed. And now the next uh, round of thousands of villages will come up. There are these schools. Little boys at the age of six start and they come out to PhDs and PhDs of the finest work. Some of their work has already been published in international uh, professional magazines, something that's never been heard of with a new university. So small, only six, eight hundred uh, students and already some 50 PhDs. And with the finest work at the very leading edge of science hmm, coming out. Well, all these kids, they start, you, you see them sit on the veranda. You know, they're little tiny ones and they sit right among every age group. And then the teachers are with them also. They're all just kids at the feet of Swami. Not one has ever paid one cent for any part of their education, or will have to pay. All this education is free, and it is producing a whole new generation of citizens. The blue kerchief worn by the men and the orange by the women signals that they're volunteers. Volunteers do much of the work that keeps the ashram running smoothly. Women in beautiful saris are not above the most menial task. say their lives have been changed by contact with Sai Baba is quite extraordinary. Art Brumfeller from Ojai, California. I knew Swami, I'd read his teachings, I'd understood who he was, what he was saying. It really meshed with a lot of other teachings and other ideas that are so prevalent now in, in, the, in the U.S. and in all the West. The New Age thought was actually old age, but doggone I didn't get it, so I came here. And you don't get it, you don't get it in your head, you don't get it in reading, you don't get it in thinking, you get it in your heart. And that's when you get Swami. That's when you get the idea of the avatar, the idea of God, the omnipresence of the being, the real depth and feeling of love that he conveys. And that's, that's just it. That's, that's where it all is. Uh, you can read all the books, you can do all the sadhanas, you can do all the practices, you can get up at four o'clock in the morning and sit in the temple and you can stay on the left and do all the things that you're supposed to do, but it doesn't mean anything until you get him inside. It's in your heart. And once you get him, boy, you get on that train and you just can't get off. It's an ever, it's just a, just a moving experience in all aspects of your life. Subsequently after, uh, after connecting with Swami on the deep inner level, my entire life changed. I've created a new business for myself. I've created new relationships. I 
relocated to a different part of the country. And that was only eight or nine months ago. I'm really anxious now to see what's going to happen after this visit because, again, being from my background, a real left brain engineering type, time schedule, do this, do that, be here, be this place at some time, my entire thought process is totally turned around. You just, you can't do that. You don't, I don't, I choose not to do that anymore. I live one moment at a time, hopefully in Swami's arms, and it, with him in my arms and my, me in his arms in my heart. There's just no different, no, just nothing that can compare. Uh, on that same first interview, he took me into a private room, and I was, I was born again there. Not a Christian uh, uh, born again, but a Sai Baba born again. <laughs> if you know, uh, because, well, he didn't, the, the love poured from him like it was coming from a fountain, you see. You see nothing, but you feel an indescribable flow of this prema or divine love coming through you. And it seems to melt your whole body. It seems to melt any hard places in your body, your mind and your astral body and whatever you're made up of. It flows through them and I could only describe it feeling as if there's warm oil flowing through every cell of your body. A wonderful feeling, but that doesn't really give it. But that's the only thing I can say to try to describe. And uh, it goes on while you're with him, while as he wants it to. Some people get it in the Darshan line. I got it in a private room with him. But while he was giving it to me, he was talking and being like a, a million mothers to me, you see. He didn't get in any particular position or touch me or anything. He just talked and it flowed from him into me and changed my life at that moment. You ask about uh, what Saw Baba's teachings meant to me. Well, I guess I would say the most important thing is that it confirmed the universality of the truth in the different forms because I had my first spiritual journey went with more tra traditional Western uh, Christian forms and then I uh, was introduced to A Course in Miracles and then to the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ which gave me a more enlightened based on my experience, the more enlightened view of the teachings of Jesus. And then I could go back to the Bible and with this clearer understanding see that the truth was there too. And if you look at the Bible with love and follow the intuitive wisdom of love, you will find the truth in the traditional uh, Christian Bible. And uh, Saul Baba's teachings uh, are the same. Uh, as the Aquarian Gospel, the Course in Miracles, and uh, the intuitive uh, understanding of the Bible. Yeah. As Baba says, there are many ways to God, and there's only one religion, the religion of love. We call ourselves Christian, right? Mm -hmm. There are Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, every religion. Swami teaches us how to find God who is beyond all religion and not to be hooked on any religion. He said once, it's good to be born in a church, but bad to die in one. <laughs> in other words, we should have gone beyond it. <laughs> the, the process here, and this is what amazes me about Sai Baba the most, is that other spiritual paths and uh, other gurus and other ways of reaching God, and there are very many different types of means, but they're always approached from the point of view that you are not God now and you're trying to become God at some future date, whereas Sai Baba treats you as if you are God now and why are you pretending that you aren't? And that's the miracle of being here. When we're demanding attention from him, when we're demanding um, for him to do things for us, when we're putting expectations on him that we would put on any other human being in our life, in our relationships, on our friends, in our careers, any of these things, 
then he just won't buy into it because we're not coming from our place of divinity. And he only recognizes us as divinity. And so when we're acting in those ways, he treats us as if we're putting on an act. And finally, if we insist on playing this act, we, we experience more pain and more pain and more pain because we become like two-year-old children whose expectations are not being fulfilled. And when we're ready to surrender into our true self, into our divinity, then all of those areas of pain and conflict disappear and all we experience is peace. And we find out what he's been trying to teach us all along and that is we are God, we have always been God, and we will always be God. Why are we pretending that we aren't? And that's why he's come. As Saul Baba says, at what he is, and as Jesus said, what he, he is, that we all are in potential. And it's our fear and doubt that block our experience of that. But the message that he has is that there is isn't only one religion, it's the religion of love, and there should not be the secularism and the, the maintaining of pride, of religious kind of righteousness. He expresses the fact that all religions are equal and that no one has the answer. He believes that, that the understanding of human nature and the, the amount of kindness and love that can be shared will transform the earth. Swami says you don't have to change your religion. If you have a religion, you should follow it and become a better Christian or a better Jew or whatever. He teaches me love. He teaches me first how to love myself and then how to love others because you can't love others when you don't love yourself. And to love yourself is the biggest task in life. <laughs> well, actually, there's nothing else, you see. There's really nothing else. He is everything. And once you've found him, or he's found you, you become sort of hooked on God, as it were. <laughs> Swami teaches at many levels. He teaches at the level at which you can receive him. He says, I will give you what you want so that you can want what I really have to give you. I mean, what is the highest level that he teaches? What is the highest level in Vedanta? Swami is not teaching something new. He's the Sanatana Sarati. He's the uh, ancient charioteer. He teaches what has been taught by Krishna. He teaches what has been taught by Rama, what has been taught by all the great teachers of uh, ages past. That you yourself are God. You are God. Don't look to me as God. Of course I am God, Swami says. But you are also God. Therefore, treat each other as God. Don't treat each other as, uh, this one is useful to me and this one is not useful to me. This one I want, this one has something for me, and this one is somebody I want to push away. Huh? Love is your nature. Love is your essence. Goodness is your Buddha nature. Live it. Live it in practice. Don't go calling me God. Don't say, oh, I love you, Swami. I love you, Swami. Show your love by how you live your life. That is Swami's teaching. And they live it because the idea is not just to take the courses, it's to live his teachings, to really be um, an example. You know, that's why you have to be very careful with uh, education and human values. Swami has said, just, uh, you know, that's book knowledge. You really have to be the example. His life is his message. He teaches us to do similarly. You know, let go of the desire which keeps us bound down to the world. Find something finer. Explore, uh, open yourself, evoke that grace of being in bliss, being in joy, being in that loveliness, that sweetness, that uh, goodness that is our truth. It's already there. Swami says, I cannot give you anything. I, I'm only a dobi. I only, I'm a washerman. I only take away. I only help you to remove this false notion that you are a struggling being in the world. That is the, that's the great message of the avatar. And that hasn't come with such force and such purity and such immediacy and such uh, uh, identity for thousands of years. That's totally unique.
and that can't be compared with any other message. That's Swami. Uh, he is the fullest expression of the divine through man in the world today. That's what an avatar is, the fullest expression of the divine of God coming through man in the world. The Bible says, by their fruits shall ye know them. Baba's fruits are people, people whose lives have been changed for the better. The love and light radiating from them is surely proof that a very holy man is among us. Then once you come to Swami, it all changes. Huh? And he said, three, four years ago, he said, now the time has come and Swami will enter the minds of world leaders and turn them towards peace. And first will come the Russians. They are not communists, they are come you next. <laughs> they will come next. Huh? And then Gorbachev came. So, when there is that power and that love and that uh, opportunity on the planet, it is something very rare. And we can all celebrate and all be very, very happy. <laughs>